Okay, people seem sort of sat down in them. Hi, I'm Jonathan. Hey. Happy to be here. Very happy to be here. I actually used to live and sort of this part of the world ish, it's about two years in Slovakia. Um, I live in Sweden at the moment. Be here as friends, it's pretty expensive. Um, yeah, well, the wages are sort of okay as well. So it works out, I guess. So uh, I work on Pulse X stuff a bunch of the time. Uh, when I'm not working on Pulse X stuff, I'm working on other stuff, which my day job at the moment normally means teaching topics and software architecture and those sorts of things. Uh, it's just kind of good fun. Um, when I want to escape my computer, I go and visit places like this and enjoy being outside. Um, and I'm still wondering, like, what does it take to work from outside? That would be kind of nice. Uh, I'm fun to shine indoors in this job. So, um, what I'm going to talk about today is a bit of stuff that I've been working on for, well, a while. Um, and I guess we're talking about Pulse 6, so a while is always, you know. Um, so, yeah, well. Um, so, I contribute to a project called uh, Recruiter. I'm one of the lead developers on that. Uh, I didn't ever mean to be. I sort of said, oh, I'll do this one feature, and then got so in with loads of other stuff. Um, so, what's Recruiter? It's a Pulse 6 implementation. Um, that means a couple of things. It means that it's part compiler, and it means that it's part sort of library of all the built-in things. We've had about 64 monthly releases to date, so we just heard a release every single month. It's very good development discipline, and I do that on a lot of projects now, um, just because it sort of really makes you try and keep your domain line in a always shippable state, which is a good thing. Um, and let's say we have sort of 10 to 15 people who are listed in the, who committed in this, this release uh, list. But in reality, there's still lots of people doing stuff that we depend on as well. Uh, so the ecosystem things, test things, and so on. So, what about compilers here? What does a compiler actually do? Because I think that we, you know, we can kind of see that there's this black box where we throw a program source in and some magic happens and then we get something out kind of compiled and then it runs and you know, it all works. So what's in there? Um, compilers love trees. Compilers are all about trees. Um, text is basically a horrible thing to work with. The sooner we can get rid of text, the better. So basically the first thing a compiler does is look at your text and your source code and say, how do I turn this into something so it looks like a tree so then we can actually do something interesting with it. So basically we do go through a process of what we call passing which is taking the various pieces of your code and building a tree. And then we sort of fiddle around and we make other trees and we take trees and walk over them and make them into better trees. Um, and eventually it pops out something that we can call the target tree, which is a tree that represents the, the program in a very sort of close way to the, the target system or runtime that we want to run the program on. And then finally we flatten it out into a bunch of white code or assembly or something like that. So basically compilers are things that have sort of textual or flat things at the boundaries. And then they, they sort of build these, these tree structures and other data structures up as they, they go and do the work. So you can generally divide compilers um, architecturally into two big sets of things. There's a front end, which is all really about the language. So the front end is focused on what does the language's syntax look like. Um, now that we know about the syntax, what does each bit of syntax mean? So you know, what does while mean? What does if mean? What does class mean? What does sub mean? Okay, we have to meet all these things meanings. Uh, so it worries about those. It has to worry about declarations. So if I declare the variable a, then I have to know from that point in the program for the rest of this lexical scope. That's when I say $A, then that's referring to that particular bit of storage. And it goes a bit further. When I write the class, I name the class, and from then on I should be able to refer to it, and it refers to a thingy which contains whatever I put inside of that class. So that's the front end. It's all very language specific. Um, the back end, by contrast, is all about the, the runtime that we're, we're sort of targeting. Um, so the back end is, is very much about things like code generation, um, mapping these sort of higher level concepts like ifs and whiles and other sorts of loops into the things that low level things think about, which is basically go-tos. That's what we have in assembly. Um, so it 
it's sort of flattening it all out into something that's a bit closer to what you run. So that's what the back end is. And typically, um, you know, we, we sort of see compilers as a bunch of stages, and that's the way we factored it inside of Recuto. If you go and look at what we do, we basically take the source text and we take it through the parsing uh, and what we call an action space, at which point we get a tree which represents the program uh, and its, its meaning. And then we have a bunch of objects which map me, uh, which sort of declarations. And then we take that tree and we feed it into the optimizer, which spits out an improved version of that tree. And then we take that and we give it to some kind of back end, uh, which then turns it into a, a sort of more low level tree and so forth. So basically, what we're doing is we are sort of building our compiler out of these very isolated stages. And each stage takes some previous <coughs> stages output as its input. It then does its work and it returns the, the output. Uh, so essentially, it's a very sort of functional programming-ish design. Um, you know, each stage is is just really a, a thing that sits there on its own, and we give it something, it does its job, it returns it, and it's all over. So one of the most important trees um, inside of of the Kudo Plus X compiler and in the tool chain in general is something we know as CAST. The AST bit stands for Abstract Syntax Tree. What does abstract in this case mean? It means it's abstracted away from the syntax of the language. So how do you spell, you know, sub in some language? Well, it might be called fun, it's your NML. Um, we might not even have a keyword for it, it's like Java or C Sharp. Uh, so, you know, lots of languages have different ways of, of expressing things. So they have different sort of syntactic conventions for doing things. Well, we sort of only care about those for the initial passing things. We don't really care about what the program originally wrote that much beyond that. We care about what the program means. And that's what an AST is all about. It's about capturing the meaning. So here we can see that you know, we've, we've figured out that we've got some variable here, which we're going to call x. We have an integer value, which is 1. And we're going to take 2 and do some kind of addition, integer addition in this case. That's what the underscore i is. Um, so basically, that's you know what these trees look like. And of course, they're, they're pretty big. And you get a very interesting program. They're, they're enormous. But really, cast is at heart a relatively simple AST format. We only have 15 different types of nodes. Not that many. That's one of the interesting lessons you've learned. Actually, having fairly few of them goes an awfully long way, um, and it actually helps in many ways to sort of keep it relatively small as well. So when I first joined the project, I was looking at the set of AST types. I was like, no, no way. We're going to need like at least double or three times this amount. We'll need nodes for classes, nodes for all of these things. And uh, well, I was wrong. Um, no, we, we did not need that many. Uh, and we never have. Uh, so it's, it's kind of being one of those lessons. So I have a computer science background, which means, of course, I went off to the Comsky Pilot construction course and sat in class and listened to the, the very uh, energetic lecturer actually talking about compilers. Um, and uh, well, he was pretty entertaining to watch and he taught you all the, the normal stuff. And the trouble is that when it comes to building ColSex, the stuff you learn in compiler class at school is kind of necessary, but it's not quite sufficient. Um, so trying to just take those ideas and say, okay, I know how to build a ColSex compiler. Um, uh, yeah, no, you don't. Um, so what makes Perl 6 kind of interesting? Uh, you know, why, why do we have some of the challenges? Well, one thing that is slightly unusual, but not really that bad, is that we have to keep the compiler available and callable at runtime. So you know, here we have an eval. And eval shows up in various places. So here is uh, when I want to go and do, hey, it's green. Um, when I want to go and do a pattern match here, and I want to interpolate this regex uh, actually as a pattern. Um, then what I need to do is put it between these angles. If you just write dollar pat, we match it literally, which means that you have to try really hard to get regex injection these days, which is kind of nice. Uh, so, you know, that really is a form of eval as well. And eval is a little bit interesting in that you know, the most useful thing about it is that you can actually see symbols in the containing lexical scope. Okay, so when I actually, you know, 
write say here, um, the reason that I can call say is because I can see the say that is in the, the sort of lexical scope of where I did the eval. And you might say, huh, what lexical scope say? And well, say is just a perfectly normal uh, function, just a normal subroutine in Pel6. And the built-ins form the outer lexical scope of your program. So basically everything is, is very lexicalized. Now, that one is not too much of an engineering challenge. I mean, you know, it is, but it is, it's, it's not a huge deal. The one that's a real uh, bit of fun is that you can actually do bits of runtime at compile time. Okay, so um, here we're at check time, and uh, we say, and we take the current time now, and we subtract the now that we got at begin time. So these actually begin runs at the point you hit it, and check runs at the end of the compilation time. Um, so this has actually doing the incredibly useful job of telling you how much time elapsed between when you hit this line when you were passing the program and uh, the time at the end of passing the complete program, uh, which is probably useless, but it sort of gives you an example. Now, the other thing is that, you know, what about this constant declaration here? What if I want to make the factorial constant 20? Uh, what do I do? Well, you know, I, I bind, I just assign factorial of 20. But where is the factorial sub coming from? Oh, the line of code above. So what do we have to do? You know, we're a compiler chugging through this code, and we hit this constant declaration, and we hit this statement, and we're kind of like, ah, um, you know, I actually have to do something and run some code now. And it's not just that I have to run a bit of code here. This bit of code calls the subroutine. So it has to go off and say, oh, we were sort of in the middle of compiling this program but we need a little bit of it earlier. So we have to go off and compile that subroutine there, okay, just in time, uh, so that we can, we can actually call it. And of course, you can combine the two, okay, so the compiler has to be re-entrance, so here we have a begin that doesn't eval, uh, and yeah, you can add a begin that doesn't eval, that doesn't begin, that doesn't eval, you can go as deep as you want. Uh, so, well, that's just not having a the state. That one isn't quite so bad, it's the previous one. This one's fun, the grammar is mutable, okay? So, what if I wanted a factorial operator? Well, I can declare a subroutine, okay? A postfix, it's a postfix operator, we put the name of it in there, uh, we take the, the operand, uh, we make a range from one up to that operand, and this is called the reduction enter operator, so you take an infix operator like multiplying, you surround it by the square brackets, and it basically takes one, the numbers between one and n, and multiplies them all together, which is factorial. Very nice. But these things should only apply lexically. You know, we don't want it, so if somebody is writing a module, and they go and declare themselves a new operator, and they then import the module, and they just had it for that internal use, we don't want their operators to start leaking all over the place. Okay, that's one of the general design principles of Pel6. Sure, we'll let you tweak the language, but you're going to have to write a use statement or declare something to say you're going to do it. We always know what language we're meant to be passing. So at the end of the scope, subroutines are all lexical in Pel6. That's the default. So at the end of this scope here, um, this has to become a syntax. <coughs> okay? So it's not just that we have to be able to augment the parser, it's that we actually have to be able to sort of switch in to passing Pel6 plus an extra operator in this, this, this block, and then we fall out of it to go back and say, oh, that was the language we were in before. And of course, these can nest as much as you want. So you can sort of create all of these, these various nested languages. And it's not only that, it's that um, <coughs> the way that we pass is actually building up these sort of just-in-time state machines uh, to do the passing. So we actually have to factor the new operators into those as well, otherwise we might get the wrong pass. Then there's method programming. So we have keywords like crack, uh, class, module, grammar. Uh, and you sort of look at them as a, a sort of Pel6 new programmer, and you sort of say, oh, yeah, well, they're built in things. And yeah, well, they are. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't change what they mean. So a while back, I wrote a module called Grammar Tracer. And what it does is it basically takes a grammar, something that we use to pass. Uh, so there's one for JSON Tiny, for example. And what it does is it traces and draws you a nice tree showing you how your grammar passes things and where it goes wrong. 
How is it implemented? Well, it's implemented by changing what grammar means. So we actually, you know, when we hit these keywords, their meaning might actually be changeable as well. Um, so we can't just hard code one meaning or one implementation of class. So that actually leads us on to another problem because we sort of realize that, okay, um, as we go and pass a class, we create an object that describes the class, and then we go and you know, create a method which creates an object that describes the method. So we have the full sort of meta objects uh, things here. But what next? Because what happens if we need to, you know, if we just need to go and run the program straight after we compile it? Well, that's okay. The objects are sat in memory. But what if I want to, you know, take the built-ins library, which is 13,000 lines of code, and compile it down to bytecode and then just load it? Well, then I need to be able to serialize all of these objects. So we actually have to go serialize it. Um, and that's kind of fun because, you know, you can actually do things like this. You can write a begin block. You can create a new uh, type, call it foo, very creative. And then you can actually just show it in the export namespace. And now we've actually just created this, this arbitrary type without even actually writing a declaration, a proper class declaration. <coughs> so we have to handle this. And of course, um, you can screw around with stuff. Augment is the way you take an existing class. This is the int class, which is in the core setting. And we add an extra method to it. So if you do that, um, well, what do we do now? Because we've gone to change this object. We've already serialized it somewhere else. Well, we have to detect the change and then re-serialize a new version of the thing. Um, so there's all kinds of sort of fun going on inside of here. Um, then there's optimization problems. Okay, what's an operator? Well, it's a call. Okay, when you write A plus B, it calls in fix plus on A and B. And then we have, this is a multiple dispatch. It's a call that has a bunch of candidates. So we have one for integer addition, we have one point, we have one for rational. And you can imagine that if we actually do that call for every single uh, you know, time we write plus, um, well, yeah, that's really going to be nice and slow. Um, so we actually need to do what we call inlining. And to do that, we have to be able to analyze calls like this at compile time. And if we're going to analyze calls like this at compile time, we need to build a very rich model of the program in order to be able to do that. And it's not just the types, like int, are things we can look at and always know what are. Um, you know, people can not only introduce their own types, which is fine, but because we support metaprogramming, they can change what type checking means, which we also have to take into account when we send in the optimizer making decisions. So, basically the way that you, know, you kind of started out in Kudo is that suddenly a lot of the thinking is very conventional. We built a relatively conventional compiler. The grammar engine was pretty innovative. Um, Patrick Misho did a, a really nice job there. Um, and you know, we, we ended up doing the passing very well. But there was a lot of things which, because we'd adopted a sort of relatively sort of everyday compiler architecture, what we kind of found was that certain things were not handled or were not handleable very easily. Um, every time we had to do something at begin time, it was horrible. Um, every time that we compiled the class, we, you know, we hadn't got to the point of having figured out the serialization thing. So what we'd actually do is we'd compile your class into a set of instructions, which basically ran at startup and created all the meta objects, which is kind of okay, but you know, not very fast. So we made a lot of things work on the outside. It looked promising, but in the inside, it kind of felt like throwing a hedge like that, um, you know. And, <laughs> I mean, it works. You can do it, but if you have to know your hedge like this every day, you know, I mean, the, the, the end user doesn't necessarily notice the problem. They just see a hedge that got mowed. But you know, if you're the guy doing this, you're sort of looking at this thinking, no, 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 no. We should not be doing this. And this is kind of what it started to feel like as we started to sort of build more and more features uh, into things. And I, I kind of think this happens in a lot of projects. It's sort of the ignorance curve. You know, you start a project out, any project, but the, the point of maximizing ignorance. 
And hopefully at some point you sort of have an aha. <laughs> this, is, this is the point where we sort of finally sort of grasp what we're trying to do. Um, and actually for Rakuda, if you followed the development, you know that there was a branch that was called, was called NOM, uh, it stood for New Object Model, uh, and actually ended up doing a lot more than that. And basically this was the point where, you know, kind of the aha, we, we really must actually build different. Um, you know, so one of the problems that we realized was that the grammar uh, and actions um, needed to be split up differently. Uh, we needed a first thing that took care of declarations, and that code had been scattered all over the place. Uh, we needed to make this whole object creation during parsing and compiling just a really easy thing to do. In fact, we needed to make the whole begin time handling just a, an easy thing, so that it wasn't an ordeal in all of the different places that we needed to do it. So basically, this set of things which do not you know, really handled in a clean way in the original architecture, uh, you know, we came back and said, well, these, you know, we can't afford to treat these as these sort of weird special cases. Um, they're not very special. They're things that happen all the time. Now, around the same time this was happening, um, we, you know, we were sort of aware that languages like Ruby and Python uh, we're getting ported to sort of the virtual machines. So we had IAM Python and IAM Ruby on the CLR. Um, we had various forms of those languages over on the JVM. And so the one question was, well, why, why not Perl? Um, why should we not uh, have Perl 6 there as well? And, you know, Perl 5 runs on loads of platforms. It's great. Um, the thing is that the world has sort of moved around it. And these days, a lot of the interesting platforms are not hardware and uh, CPU combinations, they're virtual. So you can find places where their policy is we deploy anything that runs on the JVM. It doesn't matter the language, it doesn't have to be Java, it just has to run on the JVM because that's what we run. So if you want to run everywhere, then a bunch of the everywheres these days are not about you know, physical hardware things, they're about virtual environments. If you're going to be over an everywhere language, you, you know, provide ways to do it on all the platforms, these virtual platforms kind of matter. So we're kind of aware that you know, we, we really needed to do this as well. Uh, and one of the sort of things we realized is that building all that we've built so far has been very arduous. It was a lot of work. So we didn't want to sort of build this in a way where just like with you know, the languages like Ruby and Python, what we would do is we would go off and just implement this, you know, as recruit on Paris, and we'll just leave the other ones to, to someone else. Um, we kind of realized that it would be really nice if we could reuse the investment that we've done in getting this stuff done, um, and then just plug it into different ways of turning that into code for, say, Parrot, for JVM, um, maybe for JavaScript, and these various other languages. So the grand plan was basically, um, you know, do this extensive rework to to get solve those underlying architectural problems. Get rid of all of this, this mess and the things that were really hard to do, make them relatively easy to do because we have the right primitives. Um, we didn't go all the way into all the things, we just tried to get the architecture in shape so that it would be possible to get all of these things brighter as we went along. Um, that actually ended up taking longer than we imagined. Um, many people whined. This is one of the great things if you sort of make the hard decision of we really should do the right thing here. Um, you know, people will look on the outside and say, oh, you had all of these things working already. Um, and you kind of have to be on the inside to sort of know that, yeah, well, that was all very nice, but we were, you know, the cost of getting each next thing was just going up and up and up. Um, so, you know, it, it kind of had to happen. Now, one of the other questions is what are we writing all this stuff? Uh, and that actually became very important as soon as we knew that we would want to port this to other backends. So initially, we wrote pieces of it in a language called NQP. NQP is not quite Perl 6. It's a small subset of Perl 6 that we used to build the compiler stuff in. And early work has sort of used this, but we've then written loads and loads of stuff in Parrot's assembly line. Now, have you ever tried to maintain anything really complicated in something that's essentially an assembly language? Um, you kind of do it once in your life, and then you realize that you shouldn't. Uh, so, 
Yeah, well, anyway. Um, but the other problem was that it sort of meant that for people to contribute, they had to go and learn this. And it was sort of making it harder for us to grow the contributor base as well. So essentially, we ended up sort of saying, well, we'll just write all of this in MQP. Well, you know, apart from a bunch of the, the built-ins, which we'll write in Plus X itself, uh, even MQP ended up being written in MQP. So it became a self-hosting component. And this would prove really important for, uh, for the, the porting effort. So the overall architecture we arrived at is Kudo, which has various pieces in it. I don't even talk too much about them now. Uh, and then we have MQP, which is bootstrapped and written in itself. And these basically uh, sort of boil out as kind of VM abstraction layer. Um, and then we have various VM specific bits. So this is kind of what we ended up with. And um, after sort of the, you know, we've got all of this done, we've got a bunch of sort of nice features in place and so on, and it was time to start working on the JVM stuff, the plan was and that all of that stuff at the top and some of that stuff down below would stay exactly the same and we just drop a couple of new pieces in here. So, so was the plan. So the first thing was that if we're going to write this in MQP, we need a way to make JVM bytecode from MQP code. So I came up with something called JAST, JVM abstract syntax tree. Basically, it's a small tree representation of JVM bytecode. So here you can see we have a method. Its return type is i, the integer. Uh, it takes, it's going to put a constant one on the stack and do an i return instruction. Uh, and essentially, I then just built this up with a bunch of tests. So at this point, I had a way to get from something I could build in NQP to a piece of JVM bytecode. Now, I didn't actually want to do the bytecode implementation. You know, generating all of these byte streams, that would just be really boring. So I basically dumped out a bunch of text from the AST and then fed it to a program that was written in Java and turned that text into bytecode. Now, at some point, now we have it all in process, we'll throw away the textual stage and we'll go straight from the tree to the bytecode. The second step was to turn that high level tree, that thing that we get out of the Pulse 6 front end or the NQP front end, into something low level that we can run on the JVM. So basically, that involved doing a lot of the sort of porting of runtime support. I won't go into all the details there. Um, but essentially, the set, this was the, you know, the second step. And again, I built a bunch of tests. So here's a chunk of pass, it's a block, it does a say. Okay, and here's the thing to, to be going to say. And the thing about this is it's, you know, it's much higher level than the, the JVM bike. Um, we're not sort of doing all of the stack operations and so on there. Um, so what's happening between here and the JVM is we're basically turning this into the other tree, and that tree is then getting turned into JVM bike. Question? Yeah? Is it fair to say that this JAST thing corresponds to Pirates Post? Yes. Okay. Yeah, basically. What is that a script? Not really. They're, they're playing the same role. It's just that, um, I mean, the JVM is a stack machine, um, which means things end up packed a bit differently. That's not as important as it might seem at high level. The two are in generating register code and generating stack code are different, but it's not like one is harder than the other. They're just different hard. So, yeah. OK, so next. Hey. Huh? Can you go one step back? Can I go one step back? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. This one, right. So you said that ASD is from abstract index tree because it's abstract of the virtual machine. So now it's JVM abstract index tree, so how is it abstract? No, no, no. This is abstract from the virtual machine. This is the thing that the Pel6 front end produces. Okay. So what my test is doing is it's saying if I take this ASD yeah. and then I feed it to the, the JVM translator, does it do the right thing? So does it actually say that string? to stand it out, but if I run the program that it produces. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, you said it corresponds to post, and post was about opcodes in the oh, Post is the parrot thing. Yes, I know, and this is JVM thing, but... No, 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 JAST corresponds to post. Yes, not I'm, I'm not talking about JAST, not cast. Okay, JAST is that one, though. That's, that one's JAST. Yes, this one. That so one. It, is it abstract as well? 
the AST is a bit of a stretch there. I'm not quite sure why it ended up being called an AST in a way. Um, just because JASP is something I could say in one word. Um, I, we could have called it JOST, which is Java of Code Syntax Tree. Yeah, we could have called it that. I mean, it's sort of, the assembler does a bit of work uh, to get it all to work out, but um, it's, it's fairly thin mapping. Well, you can submit a patch and call it JOST if you want. Okay, I'm doing a record to that. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> you'll have fun writing that patch, because you'll also have to take care of the bootstrap. Oh, my. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Um, okay, so basically at this point was the sort of big moment, okay? Because this was where we would test if one of the big theories of the whole project worked. Basically, can we take the existing NQP parser and grammar and actions and all of that stuff that we built to originally target Parrot, and then instead of it going and generating code for Parrot, we just go and plug in, after we get the cast tree, this new JVM backend that we've been building up with all of these tests. And uh, the answer was yes in about 20 lines of code. Um, so um, that's. Yeah. So this, this is sort of one of those times where I look and say, yeah, uh, our architecture has some good properties. Um, I, this, the one I did last year was when I managed to write a debugger without like, changing a single line of code in Rakuda, uh, which proved that another part of our architecture was sufficiently abstracted. Nice. Um, so, yeah, uh, architecture win design pays off. And this was design on the multi-year scale. The, the stuff that I did to try and work up to this has basically ended up being a couple of years worth of, of work. Uh, even if the stuff that's happened to do the JVM things has been less than six months of what they've got. So. Okay, now one of the really nice things, if you do this right, is that now we have something that we call a cross-compiler. It's running on Parrot, but it's running the JVM uh, sort of back-end production stuff, so you have a cross-compiler. You have an NQP that's running on Parrot that turns out bytecode for JVM. What can you do with that? Well, since NQP is written in NQP, then what you can do is you can take NQP's source code, throw it into your cross-compiler, and out the other end pops an autonomous, not dependent on Parrot, version of NQP that runs on the JVM. So basically, you don't actually port the thing. All right, you get NQP to sort of spit itself out on the new virtual machine, um, which is really nice. <coughs> that's sort of one of the, that was the second big payoff. Um, so basically, the job really was write the new back end and then just get NQP itself to cross compile itself, and then we had NQP on the JVM. Uh, nice. Um, so there we had it. Uh, at this point, we had a, a self hosting NQP. Now, of course, that just leaves us one more question about NQP. Um, which is a slightly mind-twisting question of, can NQP running on the JVM produce a new version of itself that runs on the JVM from source code? <laughs> Don't think about it too hard. Um, but basically, um, the answer was um, uh, yeah, yes, eventually. Um, there was a few sort of things I had to do. So eventually, we, anyway, we ended up with an NQP on JVM that could build itself. So now, when you go and build NQP for the JVM, you just need a JVM. You don't need uh, you know, any Parrot dependency or anything like that. And if you want to build NQP on Parrot, you just need Parrot, you don't need the JVM dependency. So you, know, you just need the back end you're going to build the thing for. We ship the stage zero to compiler for each of them, and it just builds the latest source. Question? So no one needs to share at all anymore? Sorry? <laughs> No more needs for Parrot anymore? If you want to run NQP on the JVM, yeah. ah. then you don't need it. If you want to run NQP on Parrot, then you have most of you. So, yeah, so you have a choice. And you don't, the point is that you only need the platform that you're going to build it on. So we're not cross compiling here. We actually, you know, we actually can do the, the whole thing on JVM um, if that's what you want to build. Okay, so what about Rakuto? Well, um, yeah, that's some fun as well. The thing about Rakuto is most of it's written in NQP. Um, and we could now actually have an NQP compiler that ran on the JVM. Okay, so in theory, all, all we have to do is get the NQP on JVM compiler to compile the Perl 6 compiler. And then we'd sort of be a long way there. Um, well, kind of. So this bit went pretty easy. 
Um, the, you know, the, this bit over here is the, the thing that passes Pel6, the example Pel6 code means. Um, so that bit wasn't too bad. Then we have a bunch of stuff called meta objects. Meta objects are the things that say, well, what does a class mean in Pel6? What does role mean in Pel6? What does grammar mean? So essentially, it implements the type system. Um, so we had that bunch of code in MQP. Then we had this thing called the bootstrap. Now, while the Perl6 grammar and actions were basically not a big problem to get ported. I mean, NQP is a subset of Perl6. We could already do that. It's nothing new. It's just bigger. So that wasn't a problem. Um, the meta objects are kind of the same. NQP has a bunch of its meta objects. So this is just the same, but bigger. Um, the bootstrap is a bit of a different story. So the way that the Perl6 bootstrap works is instead of piecing its type system together every time you run it, because we have serialization, what it does is it has a huge big inborn. And I mean huge. It's like a thousand line long big inborn. And what happens is it runs that begin block, which produces all of the objects, and then we serialize them. So we don't have to do the work every time you start up Rakuda. This is the point back in Rakuda's history when we introduced this, when our startup time basically went from you know, a second to 0.2 or 0.3, depending on your hardware. Quite a big way. So, once you have all those, okay, so at this point we have this piece, we have this piece, and then we get to the core setting. This is where all of the built ins are. Okay, now the core setting is written in Perl6, which means that you need a Perl6 compiler to build the sort of rest of Perl6. And it's about that long. Okay, there's 30,250 lines of code. Um, and this is the first test that I have to do on the compiler running on the JVM. Um, so should I sort of, you know, try and put it down somehow? Should I try and call, you know, do a setting light? And I sort of thought about this, and I was like, screw it, let's do it all anyway. So basically, um, it works like this. Getting from line zero to line 100 took about a week. And then people were teasing me, like, oh, 100 lines a week, this will take a while. Uh, so then I got from about 100 to 1,000 in a week. So then started teasing me about, oh, it's 100 lines a day. Um, so uh, then I started going from like 1,000 to 2,000 in a day, and then 2,000 to the whole 13,000, actually, with just one more day. Uh, so it all went like that. Um, so yeah, well, what you're hitting at the start is every single possible problem. Now, the problem with doing this stuff is that you're not actually just trying to get the thing to pass. If that was all we had to do, then it wouldn't be so bad. Um, the thing that makes it a little icky is that line 137, you hit this. It's a begin block. What does a begin block mean? It means you have to run it. What language do we have to run? We have to run Perl6. So you can't actually build the Perl6 built-in without being able to run Perl6 code. So basically, I couldn't actually like, compile the standard library without being able to run pieces on it. So that was fun. Um, and you know, that meant that by the time I actually got the pass to finish, it actually implemented most of the runtime support to actually support running Perl6 code on the JVM. So finally, around a week or two ago, Perl6 minus E, this is running on the JVM. OK, say hello JVM, and it popped out hello JVM. There wasn't much happiness. So, um, we can do Hello World. Can we do anything else? Yeah, um, actually, a reasonable number of things. Uh, so, one of the things about working your way through the core setting is it actually touches quite a lot of pieces of the, the Fel6 code, including even doing some very basic listy stuff, uh, definitely doing a load of hashes. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's a whole load that actually does work, and then it's a whole load that kind of doesn't. Uh, so, the thing about this though is that basically we've got the entire standard library cross compiled. So, it isn't a problem of can we compile it anymore, it's just a problem of which bits don't actually work. So, what's coming next? Uh, the next step is pass the sanity tests. Basically, a bunch of basic tests that test can we do enough to actually run the test harness, the test module, test piano. So these are just tests that spit out tap using a bunch of state say instructions. Okay, so they don't really use a proper tap module, they use the say like that. Uh, and once we can pass those, then we are able to compile the test PM. 
which means that we can then start attempting the specification tests, of which is about 740. 56. So, sorry? 756. 756. Okay. Did you just take the number of lines in spectest.data? No. Okay, good. Because if you did, you have to remove the comments at the start. Okay, well, fine, my job is done one time. Um, so basically, the goal is to get through that, and then after that, it's going to be a case of getting the ecosystem up and running with this. So it's going to be teaching things like Panda, which is the module installer, uh, to be able to install modules uh, when we're running the JVM as well. Um, so, Heaven uh, Tajik is around somewhere. I'm your hair, hello. Yeah. Hey, hello. I, I will be talking to you soon about Panda and JVM. Great, cool. So, Tajik made Panda. It's great. It is? It's because it's really good if we get to have pictures of cute pandas everywhere. <laughs> um, performance. Okay, it's a big disclaimer time. I haven't optimized this yet. Okay, so the numbers that I'm going to show you are the, the numbers that I, we get before I actually spend time getting it to go fast. So, um, basically, this is a case of sort of make it work at all. And I'm still very much in the make it work at all phase with the Pulse X stuff. Um, you know, we can do Hello World, we can sort of do some of the basic sanity tests. So the numbers you're about to see are not uh, sort of, you know, the, the end game. This is the, the baseline from where I'll start. So here they are. Um, if you run a, a one of my guys, Nick Clark, has been running very regularly uh, the Levenstein benchmark, uh, running in NQP, not in Pulse Xcode, but in NQP. And he's reporting that on the JVM backend, that runs about 15 times faster, which is a good start. One of the things that sucks about working on Rakudo is that you spend quite a lot of time waiting for the core setting to compile if you change something in it. So you change it, you sit around waiting for it to compile. Um, the pass phase of that goes about three times faster on the JVM, which basically means that um, not only does that mean the program pass a bit faster, it means that we're going to be able to build Recruiter faster, which means it's going to reduce our development cycles, which is going to be kind of nice. And if you just do a stupid while loop benchmark, this is something that Recruiter is capable of running on the JVM now. Um, that comes out about five times faster. Um, I think we've got quite a lot of potential improvements to do on that, all of those. Um, so basically, the baseline before I start optimizing is anywhere between three and 15 times faster. So far, that's not a bad starting point before I actually focus on making it faster. So, um, yeah. so I, you know, we, we definitely have work to do here, um, but it's a promising start. When um, the June compiler release of Rakudo will be the first one to ship with some level of JVM support. Um, I'm not going to commit to how much that will be, um, but it will be at least for the world. I have between now and when. The next release happens in June, which will be around sort of the 20th ish, I guess. Uh, so uh, we have plenty of time to get further. My aim is that around the August release, we should be doing pretty much all the spec tests. Uh, I, I think we can, we can get that. Um, beyond that, I hope that we'll also be working towards the ecosystem. So my aim is that Recruiter Star, which is our distribution release, so the compiler releases are just a compiler. The star releases include also a bunch of modules, the debugger, and all of those things. Um, I'm aiming for something like September for that. Um, one of the nice things about the debugger is that it's written in NQP, uh, Pulse 6, which means that it should just work on JVM uh, without any extra work, which is kind of nice. So the good things about using the JVM to run Pulse 6, um, it's mature. Well optimized, it's been around for ages. Um, they do some scary optimizations. They mine like nine levels deep by default. That's pretty crazy. Um, the other thing that makes the JVM especially interesting is that they actually have been doing quite a lot to support languages not Java. That includes this new instruction called Invoke Dynamic. You might wonder what one instruction is as a contribution. In fact, Invoke Dynamic may be one instruction, but it's actually the gateway to a huge framework of things. Which basically, if I had to summarize it in a sentence, um, it's a, like, you can teach the JVM how your language works. 
And it's not just teach to JVM, you're teaching the JVM's JIT compiler how your language works. So instead of us having all of this bunch of dispatch logic for methods, which of course we have to have because Perl 6 method dispatch is kind of interesting, we can have it, but we can keep it off to the side. And we can actually tell the JVM, look, this is what it means to call a Perl 6 method, and here is what we resolved it to, and here is a guard ball so you can look at it in the future and know that if the type matches, just go there. And for sober teams, we have it even easier. And what this means is that we can actually teach the JVM enough about Perl 6 without changing Perl 6 semantics. We can teach it enough that it should then be able to start doing a bunch of its optimizations for us. So the inlining that the JVM can do should start applying to the Perl 6 code. Um, so that's a very powerful potential. One of the other things is they build this very much thinking about dynamic languages. Perl 6, as I mentioned, gradually typed its you know, you can do static stuff and you can do dynamic. So the JVM is kind of interesting in that sense as well. That, you know, it's at the end that it's done a lot for static language, static language, Java. Um, and now they're trying to make it do really well for dynamic. Um, so we can draw on both of them. It also has very solid and battle hardened threads. Um, it's, you know, they're very well used, very well exercised in the real world. So my expectation is this is where we can really start making some, some hard progress on you know, nailing down the threading model in Perl 6 and getting that practically usable, which is going to be very exciting to do. I look forward to that. Weaknesses, um, startup time is currently awful. Um, like, like really, really, really awful. Um, so yeah, part of it is actually um, just the JVM takes a while to start up. Part of it's this perfect storm. Uh, the JVM is slowest when it starts, and then as it learns about the program, it starts optimizing things. What this means is that everything that we do at startup is especially expensive. So we're going to have to do quite a lot of work to, to cut down on that. I think a lot can be done. Um, it's on my to-do list, uh, but getting stuff working was sort of priority one. So I think that if you look at it and you're like, gee, the startup time really sucks, then yeah, it does. Um, but I think we can Invoke Dynamic is something that they seem to be taking very seriously. Um, they're going to use it for the lambdas they're putting into Java 8. We believe that Java can do like functional programming after all these years. Uh, so, uh, well, Hell was only doing it in 95 or before or probably yeah, ages ago. I don't know. But anyway, um, it appears they're fairly serious about Invoke Dynamic, but it only went into the latest JVM. Um, I actually managed to find books. I managed to segfault the JVM. It feels like an achievement. Um, so there's plenty of work to do yet, of course, uh, but that's, that's just work. Uh, we've come from nothing to this far, so that bit doesn't, doesn't worry me so much. In general, I think that, you know, um, with Perl, we always have this more than one way to do it. With this JVM work, we've sort of shown that it's possible to build an Perl 6 implementation that can be run on multiple different backends. I think it's kind of telling that the naive, first, unoptimized cut of getting this to work actually has performance characteristics that exceed the initial implementation on Parrot. Um, so I don't think that we've got into the dilemma where you know, we have it implemented on one VM and every other port has to be slow because we made a load of assumptions um, about how VM works. But hopefully escape that trap, at least the initial numbers suggest so. Um, so, you know, there's, there's more than one way to do it, there's more than one way to run it. Um, will we have a back end explosion? Well, we only have so many resources. Um, for me personally, I expect to put my resources aligned with popularity. So, we'll, we'll sort of see which back ends are getting used the most, and I'll try and focus my efforts there on a lot of things as well. Um, but I'm not going to discourage anyone who wants to come along and work on any you know, particular targeting. So if someone wanted to take what I've done and say, you know, let's just get it all shipped over to the CLR and try and run it on .NET, well, be my guest. I don't plan to work on that particularly soon myself. Um, but, you know, I'm perfectly happy for somebody else to do that. Um, so, overall, 
nice little vision for this is we end up with Rakuto plus X that runs on a bunch of platforms that's fast and reliable. And I don't you know, have to worry about telling people to use this for your stuff. That um, we have modules that you can rely on being available in lots of places. The debugger reliably works across these different places. And actually, the majority of development work goes into stuff that's shared. So we try and just get the architecture, much like we have so far, kept so that when you do most things, you're doing them so they benefit all of the places we run. And there's only a sort of handful of things which are very specific to any particular backend. So I hope that we'll, we'll very much be able to keep the majority of the effort relevant to, to all of the things. And the fact that we've written so much of Pel6 in Pel6 or in NQP is sort of a key part of doing that. Um, you know, and at the end of the day, I, my hope will be you know, people using Pel6, building awesome stuff, having a lot of fun doing so. Life's too short not to enjoy ourselves. So I want to make uh, this uh, an enjoyable development experience. Okay. I'm not sure what I did when I my time budget, probably something terrible. Uh, but thanks very much. Um, I'm not sure if I have time for questions. The Pell 6 uh, is just a batch file uh, which calls uh, Java binary or what? Yeah, yeah, it's. It is a batch file, or on... Um, I'm curious what is inside. Uh, I expect the laptop and something. We generate an SH on... Uh, it's a very long line. It's a really, really long line. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we... Yeah, you don't want to type this by hand, which is why it's a batch file. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, it generates an SH over on Unixy places. Um, so yeah, that, that's part of the consistency thing. Um, you know, it's kind of nice if you build it and immediately you just know how to run it the same way you already knew how to run it on any other backend. Uh, so yeah, that's how it works. Can we run it or it just works in, in your uh, Sorry? Environment? Can you can we run it the code or it just works in, in your laptop at the moment? Um, <laughs> you can get hold of it. Um, at the moment you have to grab a particular branch of NQP and build that, and then a particular branch of Rakudo and build that, and then you can get it. Other people have got it to build, so you, know, you can do it. Um, what's going to happen sometime in the course of the, maybe the next week, probably the next week, is I'm going to merge those branches. Um, so well in time for the next Rakudo release, it'll be in the main line. Uh, and we'll, we'll then just have it as you know the normal thing. It's just that instead of running Perl configure PL, you'll we'll run Perl configure JVM dot PL and then make. So this Perl six generates the class files. We generate a class file with a compilation unit. So you know if I if I go and I look in um, here. Uh, no, different way. Uh, PM files, they are generated to class files or? Yeah, so if you look through this, then mm -hmm. um, you know, we have a, um, the, the PVC is the parrot version. We have a, um, an actions PM or actions NQP, because it's written NQP, but we just get the file extension like that. But you know, it was a Perl module that the actions PM. Um, and you can sort of see that we've got an action dot class. So basically, your PM file becomes a .pass file. It's also interesting to note the size comparisons, by the way. Um, sometimes we come out ahead. Um, the, the code that the JVM produces is smaller, and sometimes it actually comes out bigger. And uh, yeah, it's an interesting way to do so. Nail that down. Um, so. But yeah, it's a bit uh, pass file. Yeah, like one question. Okay. Uh, one question. Uh, you mentioned that Perl 6 is currently running on multiple platforms. Uh, am I right that those platforms currently are only Parrot VM and JVM? Uh, and the yeah. two platforms count as multiple? <laughs> <laughs> what, what I think I meant when I was saying that is that when, we, when I say we already run on multiple platforms, I was meaning the hardware, CPU, uh, and so forth. Sense. Uh, yes, and while we uh, yeah. are at that, 
you have probably heard about the Pi Pi. Uh, yeah. It's uh, three years younger than Pearl 6 effort. Uh, but the guys do amazing work and Alex Gaynor currently works on Topos and has some amazing results. Uh, yeah. Was there ever a suggestion to write a Pearl 6 implementation in R Python? There's certainly been a suggestion that now we have the ability to write backends um, and we've proved that we can do a JVM one that, yes, an R5, uh, a, a, a PyPy one would be interesting to do. Uh, because PyPy, so, you see, it, it currently works and is deployed uh, uh, in much places as in production. Yeah, sure. That's, that should be possible. I don't see anything that would make that not, not a thing that we can do. So, yeah, that, that could well happen. I think that getting from one to two is sort of the really painful one because you find all the places that are not really abstracted properly. Um, now that we've got from one to two, I suspect two to three will be the you know a much much easier job. Um, so yeah, I can definitely see something like that happen. Thank you. Uh -huh. Anyone? How do you see the landscape of backends changing in the next few months? That we have JVM. Well, I think that the, the interesting thing we'll need to look at is, you know, what who, what do these backends serve, or who do they serve? Um, the JVM one will serve a couple of niches very well. Um, one will be people who actually want to run stuff on the JVM explicitly. Um, another bunch will be people who don't really care how long that thing takes to start, but they do care that it, you know, runs a bit faster as it goes. Um, I think the very mature threading support of the JVM will also be very relevant for that sort of side of things as well. Um, the people who want to sort of run Pearl 6 in a way where they, you know, they care a lot about fast startup, um, they care a lot about um, sort of having a, you know, something that doesn't come with all the baggage that the JVM does, and that is much smaller and much more focused. Um, you know, I think that we have to sort of say, well, the JVM probably can't serve those people. Um, and we, you know, that's probably where the focus will be. So for me, the focus is not on saying, let's do the CLR now. Because, you know, fine, uh, we can do it at some point. Uh, there's already the answer there. And, you know, for two, I don't think it serves a particularly different or deep, sort of large niche uh, that we won't cover with the JVM. So, you know, my focus is going to be very much on the back ends that, that sort of add something we don't have. So, yeah. Excuse me. I'm very sorry uh, for jumping in again. Uh, but uh, the point of running on JVM uh, is uh, often uh, to make use of existing Java libraries. Yeah. Do you have something for that? Uh, not yet, but we'll have. Um, Basically, the way Pell 6's object systems work is, you know, it's all meta programming. Would the kill So, we can, you know, my, the way that I want this to look is basically, you know, we type in the text editor here. You know, it'd be kind of nice if we can use, um, you know, Java, util, whatever, from, you know, JVM, okay, and then, Something like that. Um, that's that's what I'm going to aim for. Uh, so, and that there's no technical reason we can't do that. Um, what's going to get really interesting is if we can take the call sites and both of these, and then hide all of the the marshalling stuff behind the book dynamic. So let's in uh, The call on problem, I believe. Yeah, this would be very cool. Uh, it's it's it, again. It's on the to-do list. I just want to get Bakudo running useful stuff first, and then this will come a little bit after. Or well, somebody will task steal it from me. I always like it when people steal interesting tasks from me. Because then they happen sooner. Okay.